be prepared to say goodbye to shaky camera footage with the recently introduced DJI Osmo Mobile 2, which is just mesmerizing to look at and reminds me of a chicken head. And I, I'm just gonna watch it do this for a while. Just play the intro so I can focus. Now, full disclosure, I did not own the first generation DJI Osmo Mobile. A lot of people asked me about it and I considered it for a while, but again, it was about 300 bucks. I played with one at an Apple store a couple of times and I was like, this is something I could see myself using, but I don't think it's 300 bucks worth it. And I was really impressed that DJI looked at that complaint as they realized it was the most common one with the gimbal and said, okay, if we're making a sequel to this, let's make sure it's more affordable and focuses on what people need. So this one starts at $130, much more affordable much more reasonable and something I can get my hand on, literally, while delivering kind of the same user experience. The idea is you're able to put any phone, ranging from an iPhone 8 all the way up to an 8 Plus and anything in between, and the gimbal is able to stabilize it. Turn your hand this way and it'll slowly pan over. Use the joystick in the center if you want to pan things more intently. You can look up, side to side. And in general, when you're just filming things throughout the day, they look much, much better. Even without using the built-in DJI app, if you're just using the iOS camera app thing, Things do look much, much smoother. And I was often told when I vlogged over on Talos of Talks with this gimbal that it looked like I wasn't even holding the camera. It looked like when I was holding it in front of me, it was just on a tripod. That's how stable this is able to give any type of footage you may throw at it. Some brief changes over the original gimbal is that it's made all of plastic instead of metal, but that I think I prefer, even though metal I'm sure gives a more premium feel. When you hold this thing for a long time, even it just as the plastic model can get kind of heavy and kind of make your arms sore. So I'm really glad that they went with a pretty durable build, but is also a lot lighter. So it's not very tedious to be holding this for long amounts of time. There is now a portrait mode option as well. And full disclosure, if you're buying one of these out there, don't do what everything Apple Pro did in his video and try to force the gimbal to go into portrait mode. That's not how it works. There's two ways you can go into portrait mode. You can tilt the handle like this, and it'll auto-correct and start stabilizing in portrait if you're into Instagram live streams or more social media type picture taking. Or, as this is kind of awkward and I don't like doing it this way, the screw here on the back of what is holding your smartphone, you can actually loosen that, which I recommend turning the gimbal off for. A lot of people try to make the gimbal do what they want just by moving it around. This whole stabilization feat is very intricate and very complicated, and when we try to get in there with our hands and ruin everything, it doesn't work. So best thing to do is turn the gimbal off, unscrew that back part, and then it will actually twist over. Then you can lock it back down. And now this time, when you turn the gimbal on, it will stabilize in portrait mode. Because of course, that middle piece is now vertical instead of horizontal. And now you can have like extremely well stabilized and extremely well in focus FaceTime calls. It's actually just kind of fun to use your phone with this on. Cause it's like face ID works immediately. Swipe up, now I'm gonna scroll through stuff on here. It's just kind of weird. One funny thing I discovered is since that the record button on here is actually just pressing the volume key over Bluetooth when you press that, it actually raises the volume. So if you're watching a video and it wasn't loud enough, press record. Sadly, there's not a turn the volume down option. Maybe they could build that into the wide zoom thing. I don't know. There's no trigger on the back like the original had, but for the most part, let's see, you got like a tripod mount on the bottom now. It really does the same thing with just those added features, which I think are nice. There's a lot of people out there who want to focus on more portrait photography and the fact that this gives you the option to do so and it stabilizes pretty well. I'm not much of an Instagram live guy. I think I did one while using this gimbal and it worked, it worked very smoothly. And I think giving people that option in a package that is much, much cheaper, less than half as cheap as the original is definitely the right way to go. A lot of people may think that since the Mobile 2 is cheaper and made of plastic, it's a big downgrade. In reality, you get a lot more with the compromise of the materials not being as premium, maybe not having as sturdy as a build. It charges via micro USB, which I'm not a fan of, but when the intention of the device is to make it cheap, you see companies usually switching to micro USB, just like the Google Home Mini. And with this, it has a battery on the inside that if you want can charge your actual iPhone or Android smartphone from a USB port in the back. So you plug in your USB-C or lightning cable and then you can charge the phone while you're filming or live streaming. It's a neat option but I'm still participating in the portless challenge. Never plugged anything into this yet so I'm gonna keep it that way. But quite an interesting package given that they're able to encapsulate all this on $130. There are some things I think they could noticeably improve on though and my experience with the gimbal has not been 100% great. My biggest complaint had to have 
been the setup process, I think what the gimbal does primarily, it's kind of a single function device, right? It's made to stabilize your footage, your live streams, your pictures, etc. Why can't it just do that out of the box? This is something that Apple sells themselves from the Apple store. You think that they would kind of look for that in a product or DJI would try to mimic an Apple-like experience. You cannot just unbox the gimbal, put your phone in and have it start stabilizing as it's doing right now. In order for all of this to work, there's quite a few steps that I don't personally think need to be there. For one, you put your phone in, you turn the gimbal on, it'll try to stabilize, but then say, I need to be paired, I need to be paired to something. And first of all, they ship them out with a 19% battery charge. So as soon as you turn it on, its battery is nearly dead, which I thought was weird. So then you have to go to your Bluetooth settings in the phone, pair it via Bluetooth. Then you have to download the DJI Go app and pair the gimbal to that app itself. And the only way to get your gimbal paired to the DJI app is to have a DJI account. This is my first DJI product. I don't own drones. I don't own other gimbals. So I had to create an account, create a password, then open the app and then pair it to the gimbal. And then it started stabilizing. And I was like, this is uh, too many steps. If you want to have an app that has exclusive features, if it's paired to the gimbal, that's great. But I also think the gimbal should just pair and work all on its own. I'm not saying you need like a W1 chip built by Apple built into it. But my point is your gimbal does one thing, which is stabilize. I feel like it should be able to do that out of the box. If I throw my phone in there, it just starts stabilizing. And then in the pamphlets inside the box, it'll say like, also our app has a lot of exclusive features, some of which are pretty cool. Within the DJI app, you have the option of doing a motion lapse, which means a time lapse where the gimbal will slowly be moving over time, which as they advertise, makes some pretty cool shots. But when I tried to do a motion lapse, it kind of looked bizarre. The camera had a hard time focusing. The footage looked a lot more compressed than the native iOS camera app. And the options they give you for the time lapse are kind of weird, like over 10 minutes, take this many pictures. Whereas I like the time lapse option on the iOS camera app, which adjusts depending on how the long the time lapse is. Whereas the DJI one doesn't really do that. There's no 4K at 60 option in the DJI app either, which I found bizarre, as that's kind of one of the exclusive things about the iPhone 10 or the iPhone 8 that no other smartphones can do is film 4K at 60. If you wanna use the app, that option is no longer there. The other thing that really bugs me about the app is everything you record from that app does not go directly into your camera roll. It goes into your DJI camera roll and you have to export it to your camera app if you want it to be just where the regular photos are. And I don't know about you, but when I'm taking pictures or recording videos with my phone, I really like in iOS that that all goes in one place. I know where it is. DJI now complicates that by putting that into their own folder where they're like, you can have cloud storage and use our built-in editor if you pay this much. And it just kind of seems like a don't forget we exist kind of scheme. One really cool option though that you have exclusively within the app is motion tracking, which means that if you're in that app and you decide to activate active tracking, you can select something on the screen and the gimbal will try its hardest to move the camera to exactly where that object is. So you can track faces, you can track inanimate objects, and it'll do its best to keep the camera pointed at that thing, which if you're by yourself and maybe you're live streaming something that takes up a lot of space and you don't have a cameraman, this can kind of be your cameraman. But again, you're still limited to that built-in app, which overall, it seems like when you're recording things in it, they're extra compressed. The 1080 at 60 footage, the 4K footage, doesn't look as crisp as the native iOS camera app. I'm not really sure why, but I've got a lot of people in the comments who've recommended getting Filmic Pro, which is supposedly gives you more options and pairs with the gimbal. And I haven't tried that yet, but I take your word for it. That probably helps a bit. But overall, I have to say for the most part, I love the gimbal, but I only use it with the iOS camera app. The face tracking's cool, motion lapse is cool, but they're not something I do enough for me to want to tolerate that DJI app, which requires your own photo library and that little bit of compression that you don't normally get in the iOS camera app. So now when I've been vlogging and when I've been showing you footage of how stable the gimbal can get things, I'm always using the native iOS camera app. It just looks better. I don't need the face tracking features. While they're cool and I'm glad they're there, it's not something I think everyone absolutely needs. 100% of the time. Besides, I can still go into the iOS camera app and film at 4K at 60, just like this video is, and therefore result in better footage overall. So for the most part, in conclusion, keep in mind, I did not own the first gimbal. This is just my first impressions on any gimbal. I don't think I've ever reviewed one here on the tech channel, is that I do think it's worth it. While the DJI setup is kind of annoying, if you already have a DJI product, it's probably a lot easier because you have an account. I think that for $300, something that provides these options is just a little too pricey if someone can spend $300 on a gimbal, they can probably spend more on a better camera anyway, and they're not going to be filming things with their smartphone. But for someone who's spending, you know, $700 to $1,000 on their iPhone and also wants to do some vlogging with it, I think buying a $130 gimbal that really, really stabilizes your footage is kind of worth it. That's not
not gonna break your bank account very much. It's cheaper than AirPods and most people get those. And it makes a noticeable difference if you're into vlogging or if you're into iPhone videography, which I definitely am. So overall it gets a positive review for me. I do recommend you check it out if you're into filming and that kind of thing. But yeah, there's definitely, I think some annoyances and some complications that might be fixed via software update later. Or if they ever decide to do the mobile three, maybe you can design it so it doesn't require an app that the first time you turn it on. I'm okay with it having an app that provides exclusive features, but why can't I just put my phone in it and have it start stabilizing? I feel like that's so simple. Or maybe when the gimbal's having a hard time stabilizing something, it doesn't just give out. I wish it was kind of a gradual slowdown so that your phone doesn't do this. It's like, oh, I'm done. Oh, geez, it like gets thrown around. Maybe it could be more of a gradual turn off so that the phone doesn't just snap around really fast when the gimbal can no longer stabilize. As that's happened to me several times when the gimbal gets tired, it'll just boom. But luckily that doesn't happen too often. Hope you guys can check it out and enjoy it as much as I am. And if you want to see more footage of what this thing looks like, subscribe to Talks. I'm using it on there the most. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one.